It is difficult to imagine a world in which most people cannot read and where books are relatively scarce. Yet, this describes the medieval world. Not much changed in the 16th century. The puzzle remains. How did reformers communicate their message on a wide scale? Certainly, they utilized the pulpit, and preaching can be understood as an example of mass media at this time in church history. But not everyone in Saxony could crowd into the castle church in Wittenberg to hear Pastor Luther preach his Reformation sermons. If people were unable to hear sermons and read printed texts, a logical alternative was cheap and accessible visual images portraying aspects of the Reformation message. The production of specific woodcuts and broadsheets were pictures painting a thousand words apiece, and the masses could understand the visual message. Many of these pictures seem strange and alien to us in the 21st century, but they were not prepared for our consumption. Though they were designed for the sake of simple folk 500 years ago, there is much to be learned from reading the visual sources of Reformation history. It is important to note that historians and other scholars of history have begun to realize more fully how much information the study of ordinary people living in ordinary circumstances can bring to the most fundamental questions of the study of history. And this is certainly true of the study of church history and Christian history itself. It's quite wrong, in my opinion, to think that church history is simply the study of popes and reformers, the Bible and theology, or church services and missionary activities. Now, these are all important, but a consideration of these factors alone cannot in any way, shape, or form be represented as encompassing all of the historical record. A consideration then of popular beliefs, and by the term popular I mean common people living in the common ordinary circumstances of life, what they thought, what they believed, uh, is very important for us to try and come to terms with, though it's difficult because they didn't write, they didn't leave very many evidences of what they believed. Now, this consideration of popular beliefs as a subject of historical inquiry uh, was basically in its infancy as recently as 25 years ago. Indeed, social history as a discipline was still in an early stage of development. I did my doctoral work in church history at Cambridge where I studied under a professor who was a pioneer in this field. And I remember a story that he told, which happened not much more than 25 years ago, when he attempted to publish an article on the subject that I'm going to lecture on in one of the leading popular journals in England. And they didn't want to publish it. They didn't want to publish it because of some of the visual images he wanted to use, pictures, in this article. Pictures that he had discovered in archives relating to church history. But the editors considered it too risque. Some of the pictures were thought to be offensive, even though they quite accurately represent the way people thought and lived and talked in the church in the 16th century. Okay, so pictures are part of the sources of history, and that's the point of this lecture, is to try and come to terms with these non-written sources, which in my view are one of the interesting and rewarding areas of historical study. And I'm referring, of course, to pictures and generally visual images. Now, like this simple woodcut, which you can see, many of them had a very clear and simple message. This lecture is designed as an introduction to the discipline of reading visual sources as a means to understanding how religious ideas were communicated and spread in Reformation Europe. But before turning to those pictures, 
it's necessary to broach the subject of literacy. The Middle Ages was a world of gestures, certainly not a world of the printed word as we're accustomed to in our own time. Now, measuring conventional literacy in, say, the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe is quite impossible with any degree of accuracy. In 16th century Germany, for example, literacy was probably no higher than 5% nationally, though that figure would be much higher in cities and in university towns particularly. So the first problem is this. How do you define literacy? Is it the ability to read or the ability to write? Or must it include both the ability to read and write? If we talk about writing, well, how much is required? The ability to write your own name, uh, to write a complete sentence, or the ability to write an essay? And what about understanding? I used to work with a man who was of Jewish descent. And this is many years ago, I was reading a book on Jewish apocalypticism. And I kept running into a couple of Hebrew words that I didn't know what they meant. And uh, since I knew no Hebrew in those days, I asked him if he could read Hebrew. And he said, yes. I said, great, because what does this word mean? And he said, oh, no. He said, I don't know what it means. I know how to pronounce Hebrew. I can actually read Hebrew, but I don't know what it says. I don't think by any stretch of the imagination we could consider that literacy, even though he knew to read from the right to the left and he could pronounce the words properly, he didn't know what they meant. Maybe the better question for our subject is not about reading or writing at all. Perhaps the issue is not about conventional literacy, but rather a query about communication. So let's put it another way. How was a message communicated in 16th century Europe? And that brings us to a consideration which I would like to call functional literacy. Even the 16th century remained for all of its humanist advances and the proliferation of books and printing presses essentially an oral culture. Written texts, I speak of books, were preceded by verbal texts like sermons, speeches, conversations, debates, if you will. And it's fair and accurate, in my view, to say that the balance of power had yet to shift from the image or the picture to the written word, to books, even in this 16th century. And while there were many, many books published and circulating in Europe, the main question for us remains this. How many people could actually read? I've already said maybe 5% of Germans could. The 16th century uh, demonstrates the notion that justification by print alone is probably not valid. The printing press certainly creates a potential for mass literacy, but once again we're still at the point of how many people are able to read those books. The popular culture Again, common people of the late medieval period, as well as the general Reformation era, was significantly visual. Woodcuts and broadsheets, which proliferated, cartoons and pictures, to use uh, terms that we're more familiar with, could put into visual form the entire thesis of a book or a pamphlet for popular consumption. Pictures or visual representations in general are themselves a potential source of mass communication. We're all very familiar with the adage, a picture paints a thousand words. And in 16th century Europe, a case can be made for this. Well, understanding popular beliefs and the structures of those popular beliefs help to explain some of the imagery in early modern propaganda or pictures. Today we find it more difficult. Some of the images that we're going to look at in just a moment 
will pose some challenges for us because they were constructed in a world that we're not part of. Constructed by people who spoke different languages than we do. Who perceive the world and even God and religion and the church differently and used symbols that don't make very much sense to us. In fact, it would be like bringing a 16th century German peasant to 21st century America and expecting them to feel comfortable and to know exactly what everything means that they see. So we're going to be doing it in reverse. But the common people, they could relate to these pictures because the pictures spoke out of and spoke into their worlds, into their worlds of shared knowledge, understanding, and experience. All of that by way of introduction. Let us now turn our attention to how ideas were transmitted from the libraries and the lecture halls of universities to the peasants of rural Europe and from the sacred houses of ecclesiastical discourse, I speak of churches, to the profane back rooms of taverns and public houses where many people in towns spent their time. And I propose that we do this in part by examining cartoons, pictures, and propaganda that were produced by people affiliated with the church, both Protestants and Catholics. And we do this in an effort to read the visual sources of this historical period as they relate to the multiple religious worlds of the 16th century. So, let us first consider the world of propaganda. I start with the cover page for a book called Julius Excluded. It appeared in 1518. It was possibly written by Erasmus of Rotterdam, whom we've met, though we're not entirely sure. The picture shows Pope Julius II in armor with a group of soldiers appearing at St. Peter's portal in heaven. Now this is an allusion to the time when Julius II actually appeared in armor outside the gates of the city of Bologna, asserting in, in about as profound a fashion as you can that the papacy was autonomous politically itself. He has Peter's key. Remember, Jesus gave Peter the keys of the kingdom. The problem here is the key doesn't fit in the lock. So he bangs on the door, and you can see St. Peter has come. The little window, Peter is looking out. Julius says, hey, I'm the Pope. Note his chest, it says PM. That's not Prime Minister, that's Pontifex Maximus, one of the titles of the Pope. The conversation that goes on is interesting, as the accompanying text reveals, but we don't have to be concerned with the text because the picture summarizes precisely the meaning. The Pope has gotten to heaven and he can't get in. If you can't get into heaven, then the Pope has to go to hell. He's excluded, Julius excluded from heaven. This qualifies as Protestant anti-papal sentiment. Another item, the devil's bagpipe, shows a devil playing a tune through the ears and nose of a monk whom we can recognize as being a religious on account of his tonsure. Now the devil appears to sit on the shoulders of the monk, but if you examine it carefully, in reality the monk is a two-headed monster. The devil has grown into a creature utilizing the monk as his instrument, and Reformation propaganda consistently identified the devil with monks. Again, you've got to try and think like some of these people did in the 16th century. We turn now to a satire on the papacy. A three-headed pope gives money to a German soldier. This broadsheet appeared around 1555. Now, secondly, in this caricature of the papacy, even the devil ridicules the pope. And once again, we see the monkish bagpipe as the pope sits not feeling very well, it looks like, and he's being mocked by even the devil. Well, the, the Catholics had their own propaganda. The goddess heresy is a satirical anti-Reformation handbill designed by Anton Eisen 
in Paderborn, Germany in the late 16th century. And this goddess of heresy is meant to represent the Reformation in general. Now there's a number of works that are given over completely and entirely to the notion of contrasting the early church of the apostles with, in fact, the church at the end of the Middle Ages. One of these is an illustrated pamphlet published in May 1521, bearing the title, The Passion of Christ and the Antichrist. The illustrations, and there's 26 of them in all, woodcuts, were produced by Lucas Cranach, the great Reformation artist, whose work we have seen many times in the last few lectures. The commentary was prepared by Philip Melanchthon, Luther's right-hand man, and the whole project was inspired by Luther's manifestos of the previous year, 1520. There's 13 sets of contrasting woodcuts. Now we're not going to look at all 13, but we are going to look at four of those sets. In the first set, drawing upon biblical narratives of the life of Jesus, Christ drives the money changers out of the temple on the left. By contrast, if you look at the right side, the Pope sits in a church selling indulgences. In the second depiction, Christ flees from the Jews who are trying to make him king, while the contrasting woodcut shows the Pope defending his claims to secular authority with swords and a cannon. Now, try to imagine the reaction of an illiterate peasant, a devout Catholic. He comes into town from the countryside, sees pictures like these hanging on poles or in windows. Is he amused by what he or she sees? Bewildered? Is he or she angry or do they not care? We don't know, but we do know that they would have seen images like this, and we do know they would have understood them. In our third example, Jesus washes the feet of the disciples, while the Pope demands that his feet be kissed. I submit to you that not even the dullest in the village could miss the point of this kind of visual propaganda. A single simple idea is displayed in visual form for all to see, and I would argue, in these cases, understand. In the final example, Cranach shows Christ ascending into heavenly glory, while Antichrist is cast down to hell. I note that Antichrist looks suspiciously like a pope. Well, not infrequently, the reformers were linked in a tradition of heresy and heretics. Of course, from a Protestant perspective, this was not uh, something negative. For example, the Maustranska Gradual, produced in Prague in 1572, has a full-page illustration of the martyrdom of Jan Hus. The music sheet is entitled Concerning the Holy Master Jan Hus. Note in the capital letter, John the Baptist, about to be beheaded. At the bottom of the page, Hus is shown martyred in the flames of the stake at Constance. Then the detail that I want to draw your attention to from the right side of this page reveals a lineage of influence. At the top, John Wycliffe rubbing two stones together to create a spark. Then Hus holding up a little candle, the flame of the gospel which is then passed on at the bottom to Martin Luther, who holds aloft a large torch. Now it's Martin Luther who utilized most fully the potential of the visual image to convey his message. And I tell you, his message was both positive and negative. We've talked about his positive message, justification by faith, priesthood of all believers and other matters, but there was a negative message, and he utilized pictures to get it across. In the year before he died, 1545, Luther himself was responsible for issuing a book called The Depiction of the Papacy. This is a small work, a picture book with nine illustrations 
accompanied by a brief text. Now, I'll refer to the text, but it's the pictures that are so simple in their presentation that I don't think a 16th century person could possibly have missed what Luther was trying to say. The first displays the pope as a monster. The text tells us that this monster was found dead in the Tiber River in Rome in 1496. And what God thinks of the papacy is indicated by this awful picture, Luther writes. Everyone should shudder and take it to heart. The second picture shows the pope in a giant mouth, quite clearly iconographically the mouth of hell, surrounded by demons. The demons are trying to prop up the papal chair. The text tells us, which again I think looking at it simply from a visual point of view, you don't need the text. It just says in the name of all devils, the pope sits here, now revealed as the true antichrist proclaimed in scripture. Now it isn't really clear in this image if the pope's chair is coming up out of hell or it's collapsing into hell. But it really doesn't make any difference because the association of the pope with hell is what Luther is trying to get uh, our attention to. The ambiguity is solved by the title that refers to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And the title of this picture reads, The Kingdom of Satan and the Pope. The third picture in this small illustrated book is a just reward for the most satanic pope and his cardinals. The pope and the cardinals are being executed on a public gallows by hanging. Note the devils carrying off their souls away from the gallows while the executioner nails their tongues to the scaffold. The text says, if the pope and the cardinals were to receive punishment in this world, their blasphemous tongues deserve what is being depicted here. Fourthly, the pope offers a council in Germany. Now here's a double picture again. On the left, you see a pope riding a pig. The official church is mocked in this depiction for promising a general council, but treating the Germans and the German state by extension as a papal pig forced to carry the pope as a beast of burden. And on the right, the pope is depicted as a donkey. He's wearing the papal tiara, the papal crown, and he's trying to play the bagpipes. He's depicted as the doctor of theology and the master of faith, but this is facetious because the donkey can't actually play a bagpipe. Only the pope can interpret the scripture, the text says, and sweep away error just as a donkey can pipe and sound the right notes. Of course, the donkey can't, and the pope can't interpret scripture. That's the whole point. Fifthly, there's a mocking of the practice of kissing the Pope's feet. The Pope holds out a flaming bowl of condemnation, but this is scorned by the two men who stick their tongues out at the Pope. Don't frighten us, they say, Pope, and don't be such a furious man with that ban. Otherwise, we'll just turn away and show you a Belvedere. And the Belvedere is their bared rear ends. Contempt for the Pope. Uh, no acknowledgement of papal authority. This is the negative side of Luther's message. Sixthly, the Pope, who's the God of the world, is worshipped. And the image shows that the Pope has treated the kingdom of Christ in the same way as the papal crown is being treated. If you have any doubts about it, Luther says, the Holy Spirit says, pour it in with good cheer. God commands it. And the three men in the picture are using the papal crown as a toilet. Another of the images of the depiction of the papacy purports to illustrate the origin of the pope. A grinning and pregnant she-devil gives birth to the pope and to a crowd of cardinals. The pope is then suckled, nursed, and cared for by the three furies identified as hatred. The second one is matricide and patricide, you know, the, the, the murder of your parents. 
and the third fury is insanity and demonic possession. Now, quite clearly, this allusion to the classical furies would probably go right over the heads of peasants. They'd be more apt to identify those three furies with witches, which were becoming a major issue in the 16th century. But that's okay if they make that mistake, because these terrible furies or witches, it's all the same thing. The pope is in bad company. That's where the papacy comes from. The origins of the monks. A broadsheet here attributed to Lucas Cranach. Three devils are perching on a gallows, and monks are being produced from those devils. And like the origin of the papacy, the message here is the same. Monks originate with the devil. And then finally, in this triadic uh, examination of the great enemies of the gospel, we have the origin of Antichrist. The papal hierarchy are shown here in this depiction as mash in the Devil's Vineyard. This is a German anti-papal broadsheet, late 16th century. Two devils are crushing up monks and priests in a huge drum on the right. Others are flying in, bringing more monks to add to the mix. On the left, you see two devils trying to breathe life into a fat, naked pope. The crushed religious who are being ground up in the vat will become the Antichrist whom the devil creates out of anger that Luther and the reformers are once again preaching the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, along with deriding the official church, and that's what these images are doing, this is the negative message. The monks, the pope, the Roman church are all part of the devil. So let us turn away from them, along with deriding the official church, her teachings and her practices. Luther's enemies, individual people, are made the subject of caricature. This broadsheet from the early 1520s shows five figures as animals. From the left, Thomas Murner, who's shown as a cat. It's a pun on his name. Jerome Emser comes next as a goat. In the center is Pope Leo X as a lion, and he's labeled the Antichrist. Then Johannes Eck as a pig, Luther's opponent at the Leipzig debate in 1519. And then finally, Jakob Lemp, the theologian from Tübingen, is shown as a dog. Now the coarseness of some of these attacks mirrors the 16th century, not the 21st century. Even the most ribald political cartoons in newspapers in the United States would not employ some of the features of the imagery that are here used. They would shy away from poking fun at people. But then again, we operate normally in the public arena off of a different platform than Luther and his colleagues did in the 16th century. They would certainly not use the kind of imagery displayed in our next example, which pokes fun at Luther's enemy, Johannes Cochleus. In this visual satire, the devil wearing glasses and with spoons shoved in his ears, which is a play on the name Cochleus, which can mean either snail or spoon, he fills Cochleus with demonic wisdom. A fool holds a mirror up so the devil can accomplish his task. Thus filled, Cochleus prepares the numerous books that he wrote against Luther, and he produces those books. People turn away in disgust because the whole enterprise reeks of the devil's filth and the, the, uh, the notion that the devil is somewhat unpalatable. Of course, predictably, in the Protestant view, of course, a monk, a priest, and a Catholic prince eagerly receive the books. Note that a group of demons holding hands have circled around the scene, dancing with glee. This woodcut has a simple message. Cochleus is an instrument of the devil. Some of the broadsheets were pretty clever. They were produced using a simple trick to convey a powerful message. I'll give you an example of one of these trick broadsheets.
This fold-out Lutheran woodcut from 1545 shows Pope Alexander VI, innocently enough labeled Alexander VI Pontifex Maximus. But if you reach down to the bottom of the woodcut and pull up the flap, the Pope is transformed into a horrible monster and his true identity is revealed as this fiend and he shouts out above his head, Ego sum Papa, I am the Pope. And you've got this trick little broadsheet and the message is powerful indeed. And it's designed to reach a popular audience. The crude rustic elements, which was most of Europe, by the way, in the 16th century. Now I want to turn at this stage from some of these simple, uh, graphic, coarse, perhaps even rude depictions to some rather sophisticated visual representations of Reformation teaching. This broadsheet, which I want us to look at now, constitutes a satire on the entire church. It dates from the year 1536. The clergy are shown feasting in the jaws of a great she-devil. The demon, you note carefully, is a giant figure, half bird, half beast, sitting on a papal bull. Note the numerous seals attached, extending into the foreground. The demon's left leg is injured. The beast uses a crutch for support. I draw your attention to the sling and the bandages. The leg rests in a bucket. If you look carefully at that, you will be able to identify it as a vessel for holy water, hence the ecclesiastical connection. The outstretched right hand of the beast holds a collection box, and there are remnants of a cowl, the monkey's hood on the right side of the head, all of this indicating religious and monastic connotations. This is a satire on indulgences and on the monks who sell them. But now look at the head. In the mouth of the demon, we see a group of clergy sitting around a table. A monk, a friar, two nuns, and a canon, all preparing to eat. At their feet, there's two demons, and above them, a number of demons are preparing the meal on the top of the head of the giant beast. The first course is being handed down to a nun through the ear. Other demons are flying in from elsewhere, bringing to the feast a canon and indeed the Holy Father himself. One demon is being propelled through the air, holding the Pope, who's got his enormous key of office in his hand. Remember Julius II had that key and it didn't fit in the gate of heaven and in his other hand a letter of indulgence or uh, some sort of papal bull. In the tree on the great demon's head, above the cooking scene, there are demons providing music for the festive occasion. The bottom line of this rather complex entertaining and interesting portrayal is the exploitation of indulgences and the official church both under severe critique by the Reformation. Another very full and sophisticated depiction is the overturning of the great Marmite or stew pot, if you will. Dates from about 1562. It's a woodcut with hand coloring and it's preserved in the National Library of France in Paris. This is a polemical print produced during the Wars of Religion and it's clearly a vehicle of Protestant propaganda. At the center, the cracked and toppling stew pot spills its broth of Catholic vestments and papal bulls. There are two forces which have conspired to overturn the great stew pot. The first one at the upper right, a female figure who is identified by a caption as truth, backed by the dove of the Holy Ghost, comes down from heaven. So we've got direct divine interaction to push the pot over with the sword of the Bible which she holds out in front of her. The second element which has really toppled the church are the martyrs. Note underneath the big pot the bodies of three martyrs 
who have died for the faith. And the smoke rising upward presses the kettle and helps to overturn it. The souls of the saints rise up to heaven, greeted by an angel holding the laurel wreath. You can see the souls underneath the billowing cloud and the woman of truth rising up to heaven. Now, in the foreground, we have the church trying to save itself. Monks and theologians try in vain to prop up the pot and prevent it from collapsing completely. On the left, they try to support it uh, with cannons decorated with papal arms, but these are cracking under the weight. On the left, fraying ropes are being used to try and pull the pot back. Uh, but even here, one of the friars is more concerned with turning to caress a woman standing there than he is about trying to save the church. If we go back to the far left, we see a cardinal stuffing his purse and fishing another hat out of the kettle, while a woman standing near him, an old woman, holds up in vain an empty bowl. In other words, the sons of the church profit and get rich. Charity goes begging. In the background on the left, two cardinals keep the people blindfolded and fenced off from the divine light, which is symbolized by the sun with Hebrew consonants on it, uh, which actually compose the name of God, though it's mislettered if it's looked at very carefully and you know some Hebrew. Behind this fenced off area, you can see the Pope. His tiara, his crown, resembles more of a wizard's hat. It falls from the throne as the insignia of his power, temporal and heavenly, are taken away from him. The legend in the foreground, written in French, and that's significant that it's not written in Latin, but it's in the common language, explains the truth has overthrown hypocrisy. And the kettle has been overthrown. It cannot be put back up by seducers despite all of their efforts. All of them put their hand to this, as you can see, but in vain. For, the, the wording goes on to say, the truth comes down from heaven to shatter the force of their cannons. Well, the artist is here glorifying martyrdom, lampoons clerical corruption, and suggests that the church deliberately has kept people in the dark and predicts the end of papal power. Well, using Martin Luther now as an example, we can examine the idea of how reformers were portrayed. First, let's see Luther as the bad guy. The column of heresy with the statue of a heretic on top quite clearly is Luther. It's an anti-Lutheran uh, pamphlet from 1526. Note that Luther has chains around his feet and demons at the bottom are pulling on those chains as though they would pull Luther from the pillar. Note that a demon is up there by Luther blowing in his ear by means of a bellows and indicates that Luther is full of the devil and his inspiration comes from Satan. This is the counter to the earlier Protestant bits we saw which showed popes and monks instruments of the devil. So the propaganda went both ways. Next we see the seven-headed Luther, Luther with seven heads. 1529, the title page of a pamphlet by the aforementioned Johannes Cochleus, and it was issued in Latin and tellingly in German. You see, because the peasants, they might be able to read German, they certainly can't read Latin. Each of the seven heads is meant to be little Luther, intended to depict a different side of his character. First, he's a doctor, wearing a doctor's cap, then a monk with a cowl, then a Turk, and he wears a turban. A priest who preaches what the mobs want to hear. And then he's a fanatic. Note his hair standing on end with the hornets swirling around his head to depict that he's probably mad. Then he's a church visitor. Luther acting as a new pope 
tongue-in-cheek propaganda. And finally, the wild man. And the head is labeled Barabbas, of all things. And Barabbas holds a club. And you can read into that very easily the violence that Luther is perpetrating against the church. Then we come to Luther's heretical game. This again, an anti-Lutheran booklet, about 1520, so very early on. It's a wood engraving, and Luther is shown as a big cook. He's serving up, brewing a huge, uh, in a huge cooking pot. Three devils are helping him out. There's two others, note in the background and to the top, providing music. A diabolical raven sits on Luther's shoulder. Now he's wearing his monastic habit, all right, but out of the pot we see arising a variety of fumes, and each of the flames are labeled falsehood, unbelief. What is Luther cooking up? What's the Reformation all about? Pride, envy, scandal, disobedience, contempt. This is what Luther's pot is yielding forth as the meal for Christians. Haughtiness, lies, heresy, blasphemy, unchastity, lust, disorder. And Luther is made to say in this depiction that he's not ashamed at all of evil. And in fact, he admits that he is engaging in deceit and falsehood. The devils with him declare they will mix gall and poison in the pot too because the common people won't notice and they'll eat it. Well, this representation obviously attempts to associate Luther with the devil and vice. We see Luther with horns now, a visual depiction of the demonized reformer who is as much the visible incarnation of Satan as can be, and he is plaguing the church. On the title page of an anti-Luther book published in 1535, Luther sits holding hands with the devil, uh, indicative of just what close buddies they are, while his other hand is on the Bible symbolic perhaps of a blasphemous pact that he's entered into for the destruction of Christendom. That's how Catholicism viewed Luther in these early decades. Note the little demon whispering into Luther's ear, once again symbolic of the idea that Luther's inspired by the forces of darkness. And the caption, which you don't need to have to get the message, is a pun upon the names of Luther and Lucifer, suggesting that they're really pretty close kissing cousins, uh, if you will. From a Roman perspective, the Blessed Virgin Mary will intercede. And here in a fresco in the Naples Cathedral, Luther and Calvin are overthrown, trampled down at the bottom right, while the Virgin saves the church from this nefarious event called Reformation. Well, by contrast, there were presentations sympathetic to the aims of the Reformation, presenting Luther as the good guy. Now, the main themes in Reformation thought are three, I think. One, Luther's an instrument of God. Second, freedom from papal authority. And three, the role of the secular princes in protecting religion. These are all emphasized in the depictions of the dream of Elector Frederick the Wise of Saxony. In this dream, Frederick sees a monk receiving divine inspiration, obviously Luther. Then Luther writes on the door of a church the words concerning indulgences. See, this is all historical. The quill that he writes with, however, stretches all the way to Rome where it pierces the ears of the lion who's labeled Leo X, and it knocks the papal crown from the head of the pope. Kings and bishops and cardinals come together, attempting to set the crown back on the pope's head. The roars of the lion call the powers that be to take action against this meddling monk, and an effort is now made to break the quill, to stop Luther from writing any further. Well, there's a variety of editions of this uh, idea, and the efforts all come to naught. For Luther insists that he got this quill from
from a 100-year-old Bohemian goose, whom you see there. That'd be Jan Hus. Remember that Hus in Czech means goose. And the goose is depicted as being burned in the lower right in some of the depictions or otherwise looking on. In contrast to Roman insistence that Luther was evil and of the devil, he is portrayed in Protestant imagery with Elector John Frederick kneeling at the cross, worshiping Christ. This is a woodcut, color woodcut from the 1546 edition of the Luther New Testament. Of course, it's Luther's struggle against the indulgent sellers that's the point of departure for his reforms. In this Leipzig broadsheet, Luther's protest is symbolized by a fight with a monster. Luther holds up the light of the gospel truth, symbolized by a large candle. The rays illuminate the words, examine the scriptures on the Bible that he carries. Luther's coming out the door of a monastery. But this monster, part dragon and part winged lion, probably Leo X, and note that the beast is wearing the papal tiara, tries to vomit water on Luther and thus extinguish the light of the candle of the gospel. Note to the left, wearing a fool's cap, holding an indulgence in his hand, but staggering under a great burden is Johannes Tetzel. Got a papal cross, wearing a backpack, which rather doubles as a wine vat and an indulgence sack. He's accompanied by three cloister mice who are wearing Jesuit hats, and they are trying to run away from the light of the gospel which Luther has helped to bring into the world. Well, the last major visual image I want to discuss is a broadsheet that is entitled The Difference Between the True Religion of Christ and the False Idolatrous Teaching of Antichrist. And it's clearly Lutheran propaganda dating to the period around 1546, and it's the work of Lucas Cranach the Younger. This broadsheet contains two very full scenes separated by a central pillar. Let us go to the left side first. We see Christ interceding with God. Now the central point is the preacher, clearly recognizable as Luther in the pulpit, preaching under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, symbolized by the dove. Note that Luther has an opened Bible on his pulpit, and his fingers point out the message displayed on the banners, which read, Behold the Lamb of God, I am the way. There's only one mediator. Even if you can't read the German, you can see that the finger is pointing to Jesus Christ. That's the focus of Luther's sermon. Now, if you go up to the top between Jesus and God, there's additional text, which I only point out to show the fullness of the message being presented. Christ is saying, Holy Father, save them. I sacrificed myself for them with my wounds. The words on the bottom text sum up the message of salvation. If we sin, we have an advocate before God, so let us turn in consolation to this means of grace. Come back to the pulpit and note there are words inscribed on the pulpit from the Acts of the Apostles. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men and women by which we must be saved. Luther is preaching Christ. That's the point of this particular visual image. Note that listening to the sermon a group of people, including the elector John Frederick, Prince of Saxony, who is carrying the cross. The two Protestant sacraments, Lord's Supper and Communion, are being celebrated in the lower left-hand side. Both elements of the Eucharist note, bread and wine, are being given to the laity. Now, what we have is a picture of Protestant religion. Let's go to the right side of this broadsheet and have a look at the religion of Rome. On the right, we have God again, but not Jesus. We've got St. Francis of Assisi. And the two of them are looking down from heaven in horror at the friars who are collecting money. St. Francis appears to be vainly interceding 
with God and God appears to be most unhappy. God is sending to earth fire, streams of fire and thunderbolts, indicating that the intercession of Francis is of no avail and that God is most unhappy with Roman religion. Meanwhile, notice the pulpit. We have another pulpit. A very fat monk is trying to preach. Uh, but notice sitting on his shoulder a little demon blowing a bellows in his ear. Uh, we've had this point before. Notice also, he, unlike Luther, has no Bible. Above him, he's not pointing to Jesus. His message is summarized. There's many easy ways to be saved. To be saved on the Lutheran part is through Jesus and the cross. According to the monk, there's a lot of different ways you can be saved, and this depiction then aims to show some. The religious, monks, bishops, and cardinals gather around the preacher, listening to this. One is holding an enormous candle. This fellow's been given a fool's cap to wear, rather than a cowl, and you can see the fool's cap hanging down his back. In the background on the left, below the cloud, a monk carries a banner of the Virgin and leads pilgrims around a church. And they pray to a saint. Two pilgrims coming from the right give us the hint that this is a pilgrimage church. In the center, you will see friars burying a man in a cowl. He has received holy orders on his deathbed. And the words intoned above him on the banner are, the cowl, the tonsure, and the water aid you in being saved. A nun sprinkles him with holy water as the two monks put the cowl on his head. On the far right, you see a bishop blessing a bell. In the center, monks consecrate an altar, assisted by a demon who's got a bird's beak, spectacles, claws, and a fool's cap, a very interesting sort of demon who's shown up for the consecration. Note another priest on the right saying a private mass. There's nobody around at all. Nobody paying attention, but he's going through the motions of religion. In the foreground, to the right, the Pope himself sits at a table hawking indulgences, assisted by a nun. His sign on an upheld indulgence promises immediate entry to heaven if you pay a groschen. Because the coin rings, the souls to heaven springs, it says. Note the money chest in the foreground. A sack of coins on the ground is labeled, this is shame and vice wrung from your offerings. And near the table, a rather corpulent monk has another money bag hanging from his waist. A monk behind him has a carnival puppet sticking out of his cowl. And beside him, playing dice and cards fall from the cowl of yet another monk. So we've got a lot of uh, derision, once again, of Roman religion. Now the essentials of the Protestant faith are laid out very clearly on the right, on the left, sorry. Preaching of the Word of God, Christ as the sole mediator between humans and God, the centrality of the cross for salvation, the sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist. But on the right of this large broadsheet, one is presented with a visual catalog of Catholic practices which are quite different from the Protestant faith. Well, all of this leads us then to the inevitable conclusion that the Reformers are the true followers of Christ. And here we see a depiction of the Last Supper by Lucas Cranach the Younger, 1565, wherein Reformers are shown seated around the table with Jesus. Martin Luther, easily identifiable, and Philip Melanchthon, and several other Reformers are there as well. Visual sources, ordinary people, getting a message out, making a point. That's what it was all about. So by way of conclusion, several points can be made about this subject. At Leipzig in 1521, authorities seized 1,000 
500 copies of a single broadsheet attacking the Catholic apologist Jerome Emser. This was a bust. I mean, they seized 1,500 posters. Imagine how many they didn't seize. It's like drug busts at airports and border crossings in our own time. Every now and then, the authorities make a good one. But for every one they make, they've undoubtedly missed many more. Now, what I'm trying to say is there was a lot of this stuff around. But it's suggestive rather than conclusive in terms of proliferation. It isn't possible to exactly say how much and how widely these sorts of things circulated. But there's two levels of meaning relevant for our topic. And these are, first of all, what was actually depicted. In other words, what is there that the author or the artist wished to be there and what the author intended. That's one level. And the second level, of course, is what people actually saw. They might have seen something that was not intended. And so there persists the danger of ambiguity. Because what was seen and what was understood were not necessarily the same thing. The sign is not monolithic. Interpretation is therefore necessary, but there's no way to control the interpretation of a picture any more than it's possible to control the interpretation of a text, even the biblical text. So interpretation relates to pictures as much as to text. And there's no way really to accurately determine how successful a particular cartoon was at conveying a message, or even to determine how well the intended message was understood, or further, in what sense it was understood. There are clearly a number of possible uses for the types of visual images we've been considering. Instruction would be one, entertainment, edification, and certainly the transmission of values. And here, the values would include social, political, and definitely religious values. Well, one might be inclined to snicker at the story that I can tell you of a doctor in the city of Constance who had a picture of Erasmus of Rotterdam on his wall so that whenever he passed it, he would spit at it. Yes, you may snicker at that story, but this matter of heresy in color, as it were, was something the official church had to take seriously, particularly when Martin Luther began sending round pictures of the heretic Jan Hus as wedding gifts. And later, when Luther's followers began claiming that pictures of Luther himself would not and could not burn, even if you threw them into a bonfire, it was all very disturbing. And the campaign of visual propaganda mounted by reformers, like Martin Luther, proved successful and irresistible to the audience that it was intended for, the common, ordinary people. And there were potentially profound implications. Well, from the perspective of the Roman Church, it added up to visual heresy, or if you like, art in the service of an idea. And that idea was the reformation of the church.